Welcome, Rebecca Vera. We are grateful that you're spending your Sunday with us as we're recording this. Remind our listeners a little bit about who you are and how you came to be involved in space. Great. Yeah. Um, let me see. There's a bit of a backstory here. Um, I grew up with a father who was a director of a planetarium at Illinois State University. He directed it for 25 years. So some of my earliest memories are being in the planetarium, listening to that planetarium music, you know, that kind of <laughs> very, uh, you know, ethereal. Uh, ethereal music. Yeah, that makes you feel like you're floating and um, you know, the, the darkness of the planetarium and then you see the beautiful stars and you feel so small, but in a wonderful way, right? So um, those are some of my earliest memories. We also did a lot of um, observation. So my dad has still to this day, quite a few telescopes and an active astronomy club um, back in Illinois where I'm originally from. So again, a lot of late evenings, observing um, cold nights, eating Snickers to stay warm and then going to pizza pizza place at midnight with a whole bunch of you know other other people who are excited about space that's fantastic did you ever discover anything yourself or were you there where things when things were discovered maybe for the first time no not for me there's plenty of alien stories though <laughs> but i was going to i was going to say i bet there was how old were the movie, not that i've seen <laughs> How old was the group for the astronomy club? Was it adults? Was it kids? Mixtures? Um, so I'm trying to think. The astronomy club probably started in the 70s. I was born in the 80s, so it was fairly well established at that time. Um, mostly adults. I think, you know, we talk a lot about the Sputnik era, and, you know, my dad was probably partly a product of that, and so it was a lot of people around his age who had, you know, either gotten degrees in physics or astronomy and um and and people who are just passionate about you know yeah, about, about the cool. I got you know a, I, I I was born in the 70s and in the 80s I got a telescope right and I just thought for sure this was going to be it I was going to see everything but it was I couldn't see anything like I just I <laughs> never figured out either how to use this cardboard tube or whatever it was and I was like well there's the moon was, yeah and, 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 and you can do the and do the moon and there's certainly different levels of quality of telescopes right yeah, there's, of the, there's the kitty telescopes which you know are probably good enough for seeing the moon and for seeing a few planets and things but if you really want to get into stuff like nebula globular clusters um yeah. you know faint you know really faint kind of stuff you you got to have something that's you know a decent size doesn't have to be terribly expensive but it needs to be big enough to pick up all that light and you gotta have you gotta be in a good place too so right I'm, right where there's not a lot of other light right I, I'm yep. from Illinois originally, and you could go out to just like a cornfield, you know, <laughs> out, outside of the city. But now I, I'm on the East Coast. And it's, it's yeah, almost it's impossible. Well, thing. well, let's let's jump right into something that's <clears throat> like a, an issue for astronomers, which is light pollution, right? Mm -hmm. Where on the Earth have you been that you thought this is the best light? You know, this is the best view of the Milky Way that I'll ever see. Tell us about that. Yeah, um, so I would have to go back to 2002. I went on a trip to Bolivia. Um, it was like a, it was a youth group kind of a trip, service trip. Um, and I remember, so we were in Sucre, which first of all, we're talking Southern Hemisphere, so the sky looks different, right? Um, and we were in a bus. It's a very mountainous area, and it was like pitch black. And because the city itself just didn't have a lot of lights at the time, you could see like the lights inside of people's houses and they looked like little candles. And then you couldn't, what was most beautiful is you couldn't see the horizon. It just turned into stars. And so wow. you had candle, like, you know, what looked like little candles and then it just had stars. And um, th that would be the best conditions. You know, the altitude is great. Um, you know, you've got dry, cold air um, and that all, you know, and then right. it, was, it wasn't as developed, you know, I'm sure things have changed. Right. So am I right with my geography? Bolivia, is that still the high Andes mountains like Chile, which um, Chile so far, has... yeah, yeah, basically. I mean, there are there's there's valley areas in Bolivia, too, but Bolivia has got some of the highest cities in the world for sure. Well, I want to pop back a little bit. So you were young, you're inspired by, you know, your dad and then you go off to school, you end up teaching physics. So let's kind of jump to the career in physics. And I know that I really want to get to understanding a little bit about what heliophysics is eventually as well. But so how do you make the leap to go into physics? Um, gee, 
so, you know, for a long time, I, there's lots of different things I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to save people's lives in an ER. And then I shadowed an ER doctor and he did paperwork a lot of the time, which we know it's all good and important stuff, but it shifted my mind about what I would be spending most of my time doing. And um, then I wanted to go into international relations and um, it just didn't jive with me. And um, I just thought about what do I really love? And a lot of the experiences that I had had in high school and even younger show and tell kinds of stuff, right? A lot of it was related to education and a lot of it was related to science. So I ended up um, switching my major from international relations in my first year of college into physics and specifically physics teaching. Um, and at that time, my dad had transitioned from being, you know, not, not only the planetarium director, but also the teacher educator. So he was preparing future physics teachers. And it was a natural transition for me, except I didn't know whether to call him dad or okay. Carl or, <laughs> you know, because everybody, but you know, it was a, uh, it was a good, uh, it was, it was a very good fit for me. That's fantastic. So heliophysics then, I mean, I'm, you know, remember I'm the English teacher side of this, uh, this cohort here that we have. So helio meaning sun. So how do you transition eventually into uh, the focus on the, why, why the focus on the sun? Like what is the relevance that, that brought you to that, that portion of your career? Yeah. So it, it was, it ended up being kind of a side opportunity because at the time um, I was the K through 12 program manager at the American Association of Physics Teachers. Um, which is just, it's a professional society for physics educators at all levels. And um, NASA had actually approached the AAPT, I'm pretty sure. Um, and, you know, long story short, there's money for education activities um, to help people in the United States understand the value of the work that NASA does. And um, one of those divisions that had, you know, a decent chunk of money was um, the Science Mission Directorate, so based at Goddard. Um, which is just outside of Washington, D.C., um, one of the NASA space sites there. And um, they approached AAPT and said, you know, we're looking to build a coalition. I think it was 26 different organizations to help people understand the research that NASA is doing on the sun. And um, so we said, yeah, would we do it? And um, I ended up getting involved, you know, because I happened to be there, but we also reached out to a variety of different folks across the United States who are mostly at universities and community colleges who teach physics and astronomy. And we wanted to make sure that the heliophysics, the solar physics that NASA was doing, you know, was doing that people understood it and they understood it in the context of classes that were actually happening. So there's a branch of, you know, there's outreach, right, which is like working with the, the public, but AAPT's role and my role was to support how do we get this into classrooms. Right. So right. that was the team that you were on, right? The idea of how do we bring this concept to, so was it only in, at the time, was this still Illinois or had you? Oh, no. Um. So yeah, at this time I was in Washington, DC. So this is a nationwide right, it's a direct, initiative. Right, right, right. Um, yeah. And yeah, I'm, I think we have a team of around six or seven folks right now. And, um, and also some really, really fabulous folks we call ambassadors. <laughs> Kevin is one right. um, uh, who helps support that work too. Right, and and I'll back up just a minute in your story. Let's back up a little bit to well, first of all, physics. You know, physics is the queen of all sciences, right? Mm -hmm. So every every time you look up at the sky or anything you see, I you know that's such a wonderful broad subject, right? Plus, uh, I I think you've got to love physics because it deals with both the very very small and the very very large, right? Physics is that one place. Um, when you started out teaching. Uh, you, you were in the classroom for a few years before you probably went to Washington, D.C. Yeah. Were you teaching in Illinois? Was your undergrad education in Illinois? Uh, Illinois? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Illinois, a lot of people don't know, but it has some of the strongest physics and physics history um, in the United States. Um, yeah, we got we had a lot of great things going there. Um, so yeah, I um, I'm from what we call Normal Illinois. Um, I, I attended Illinois State University. It used to be called Illinois State Normal University, not because of the city's name, but because a normal university prepares teachers, and so the city took the name of the university. Um, so I went to Illinois State, and then I taught for seven years. Um, and at my first school, I actually had my own observatory. Um, nice which was pretty awesome, but I was only there for a year and then I moved up to the uh, northwest suburbs of Chicago. Um, 
And then I, I got a fellowship um, at NASA. Um, there's something called the Albert Einstein Distinguished Educator Fellowship. Um, and I got a placement at NASA, but um, in the aeronautics division, not in space. Right. Did that um, not here to DC. So, you know, we've interviewed um, quite a few folks that, you know, we spent time, I spent time with in DC. Did the Einstein Fellowship change your life for good? Uh, was it for the, you know, some people would say it goes either way. What are your, um, what is your estimation of the, that program and how it maybe changed the trajectory of where you are today? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, it absolutely changed my trajectory. I mean, had I not done it, you know, I mean, there's good and bad, right? Had I not done it, I would still be in the classroom and I think I'd still be having a fabulous time in the classroom. Um, you know, the school that I left, I did not want to leave but you know the opportunity came calling um so i think the thing that was most critical for me is i had a supervisor a couple supervisors who put me in charge of things i didn't expect to be in charge of and helped me to recognize skills i didn't know i had mm -hmm. and um the einstein fellowship helps you to see kind of the role and the importance of the classroom teacher within this bigger scope, right? It gives you that cosmological view, right? Of, right, right. Of, of education. And so for some people, it disillusions them because especially if an opportunity doesn't show up for, you know, engaging at a national level in, in initiatives, I think people can become very disappointed um, in themselves or in the system. Um, it spoils it spoils us a little bit, to be honest. It makes us want more. <laughs> and some people, you know, are in a circumstance where they can where they can get more. Maybe they're able to pick up their lives and move across the country. Or you know, not everybody you know is is you know wants to do that, and that's fully understandable. So um, for me, it was a phenomenal change. But I do miss the classroom, and I'm I'm very jealous of of you know the opportunity to see children and young adults really change over the long right. term. I Sound, totally well, miss that. Right. Sounds like you maybe need your own summer camp again. But uh, I, mm -hmm. I definitely want to agree with you about the, you know, you go from being a sort of grinding it out in the trenches to mm -hmm. seeing the whole ecosystem, you know, with education. And you're right. A lot of people get, I, I've seen those fellows that get really inspired to do national things. We had one young lady when I was there she was appointed by President Obama to work in the White House, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. I don't know how much higher you can go as a teacher than that, you know, to liaise with the Department of Ed. So mm -hmm. that's wonderful. Goddard, let's just talk a minute about Wait, Goddard. before you go on, I'm still right. having a vision of your classroom with the astronomy, you know, like you had your own, almost like a planetarium. Is that right? Uh, well, I, I had an actual observatory. Yeah, an um, observatory. So all I can imagine is like your dad, right, who brought you into this is now seeing you there did he get to come to your classroom and like is sharing that experience i just had this idea of this father daughter connection <laughs> now in the classroom he, he was there so the the observatory it was if you could imagine it kind of being like out on a you know near a football field it's kind of well for that we actually had to drive to it because it was in a kind of a, a dark area so i couldn't take my kids there every day we couldn't like do you know solar observations during class um in an easy way but um uh, we did have it was one or two, at least one big open house event at night. And yes, my dad came. And oh, I'm so, I can just imagine. He's been so <laughs> happy, right? He was flashing back to the 70s, and now there you are. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I was getting no, 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 no. And, and um, you know, I've been to Goddard. Goddard's a wonderful place. It has such a good history, you know, with, and, and you mentioned Illinois. Yeah. When I think about atomic energy and how we understood yeah. the atom and the particle accelerator, I mean, yeah. so much. There's a lot of smart physicists in and around Chicago, right? Mm -hmm. So much history. But Goddard is sort of a, I don't want to say it's a bureaucratic place, but since they, you know, they, they stopped training the astronauts there, did you find you were in more of a, an administrative or programmatic uh, job at Goddard before you transitioned to AAPT? Um, so actually, I was at NASA headquarters, so oh, I, I, can't, okay. I can't answer your, your, your question um, on that. I was in a truly a bureaucratic building. Um, and most people don't know NASA headquarters is like in a federal area in the middle of Washington, D.C. Um, so it was it was a building filled with cubicles, <laughs> you know, um, you know, it, it's not like. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. we've been many times we take kids and it and you're right. It's so close to the mall that we walk. Yeah. From right. NASA headquarters to Congress. It's a yeah, the, 10 minute walk. 
Yeah, and my, so most people have no clue it's there. Um, but I, um, you know, and so there were a lot of you know there was a there were a lot of administrators and things like that. But the people in the building they've all been on the ground, you know what I mean? And some of them have been in space. <laughs> so, yeah. so there's, there's people of all types and, um, you know, they, they say NASA of all the surveys that they do, NASA has, um, some of the highest, if, if not the highest, like levels of personal satisfaction. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a great place to be. So I don't think about it as a political entity. I mean, generally, NASA is just trying to get the job done, no matter who the administration is, no matter what new regulations there are, you shift the messaging, you still get the job done, you know? Right. I agree. Uh, it is pretty popular bipartisan mm -hmm. and um, you're right. The administrators may be appointed, but a lot of those, yeah, mm -hmm. you're right. I, I think in all of my time, I think they always score in the top two or three for um, satisfaction, particularly with federal jobs. Yeah. So. Uh, I'd like to pivot a little to AAPT, and for our listeners, um, we we do a lot with AIAA, so AAPT is basically the physics educator version of an organization like AIAA. You're made up of professionals in this field, mm -hmm. so um, you're now at AAPT, and you oh, also- I was. I, sorry. Oh, <laughs> I, should, I should be that fat now. I should... I should quickly just just I'll just quickly share my trajectory. So I was oh. after after the fellowship for one year. I was at AAPT for three years, mm -hmm. and then this project started there. I still consult for them because this project has gone on now for seven or eight years. But right. in the in the interim, I was at the Organization of American States for three years, running a STEM teacher network. Um, think of like the UN, but only for the Americas, primarily Latin America and the Caribbean. And then um, now I'm at the University of Colorado Boulder and I manage FETS global initiatives. So, oh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's no, I'm I sorry. My background's extremely. No, no, that's no a, I mean, I pre recorded the bio, but like a, I knew. And that's where I was like, I'm not sure that well, he's aware. As a, uh, as a science teacher, uh, particularly in middle school, I, I don't know of anyone that doesn't really lean into the FET lab. Well, I want to talk yeah. about that a little bit. So, our, we do have listeners who might not be familiar. And I know that you sure. both are. I know what it is just because of talking with you but maybe we could take a moment to really kind of talk about what FET does, um, because I know you're the director now. I'm, I'm the director of global initiatives. So there's the actual director is, is above me and I, I work Right, close. right. But even still, that sounds to me like the idea is to bring that into the use in the classroom yes. around the world. It's so, to support it. Yeah. Okay. Teachers so have been doing for a long, long time, but but helping teachers make most effective use and then spreading that, that's, that's, um, that's our focus. It's the, the community element. So remind our listeners what that does. Like, what does FET do for sure. the non-teacher folks who might be listening? Yeah, sure. So FET Interactive Simulations is a project at the physics department at the University of Colorado Boulder. So I'm still in D.C., but I work remotely. And um, for over 20 years, we have created um, online simulations. So if you think about like a virtual laboratory space, and if I speak in terms of space, right, we've got now a couple simulations dealing with, we've got one called My Solar System and another called Kepler, Kepler's Laws. Um, we've got a few others that are also very space relevant, but the if you imagine creating your own solar system, if you added different planets at different distances, different masses, if you wanted to give them different initial starting speeds, you can, um, you know, start to understand these relationships between gravity, orbital motion, momentum, things like that. So um, it's visually, visual interactive kind of a thing. And it was started by a Nobel Prize winning physicist who ended up using the funds he got from his Nobel Prize to launch this effort. Because at the peak of his research career in physics, he, he actually took a major shift and decided to focus on physics education research. And now we've expanded to math and right. science. Carl, uh, Carl Wyman, is that yes. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, I will tell you this. Um, I take a FET lab with mechanical energy, the yeah. one, and I put it on the same screen as a Khan Academy video that shows uh, an elliptical yeah. orbit. Mm -hmm. And then I sync them up so that uh, perigee on the orbit is the same time the pendulum is at the bottom. It's oh, wow. Above, yeah. Think about that's, that. That's, that's really cool. Yeah. And then I made a little recording, but the, the bar graph, right? So I show the kids. I do a summer camp on orbital mechanics and the tagline for the camp is we always trade height for speed, right? Yeah. So your FET lab is the ideal place because every child 
if you start with roller coasters and a 10 year old, every yeah. child gets it. So I, I, I'm a big fan of the FET labs. Actually, sometimes I'll have time where I'll just let the kids choose the FET lab they want to explore. So I give yeah. them some free time to play mm -hmm. in the FET labs because they're such good quality. So That's, I, I'm so glad to hear that because in general, you know, uh, that open play is so much more productive and fruitful and pedagogically beneficial than anything we could ever give instructions to kids to do. It's way know? better than a one page handout, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I'm thinking about like kids now in other countries as you're talking about bringing this as a tool. So where are some of the areas that you're focusing on that maybe haven't had this kind of support in the past? Um, so my work specifically focuses on Africa, um, specifically Sub-Saharan Africa um, and Latin America. And we do have users all around, but it's not so much, how do I want to say it? It's not so much that teachers, so teachers in some places are truly not aware, but that's often a result of the fact that they have less connectivity. They have fewer resources. It's still totally possible to use these things, even in a low resource source context, but you might have to download it to use it offline. You might have to get creative in how you have students share devices or learn how to effectively manage a classroom of, you know, 70 kids with nothing more than a projector screen, right? So um, that's that's what my job really focuses on with a, a team of people I work with. So we really need to get the folks like Musk that are doing these global const you know, constellations we really need to increase low latency access to the internet, right? Just worldwide. That, that, that's a huge part of, of what's going on for sure is, you know, FET ourselves, we don't provide technology or infrastructure, but um, we would love to collaborate because I think these things have to come together. I mean, one of the biggest mistakes and some of the most expensive mix mistakes that I think we've seen in these developing contexts is where people go in, they put in the infrastructure or hand over the technology and it's not used effectively and it literally sits on a desk and, you know, gets, you know, gets covered in dust, right? Or sometimes the technology is there and then the electricity system goes out or it's inconsistent. And so you've got to work with your electricity providers in addition to your internet providers and your tech support folks. So it's, it is not an easy problem to solve. Um, but you know with a great teacher sometimes you can overcome those obstacles at least in the short term right fantastic it's so fantastic. important it's such important work i know that um i i don't know if you're aware but i i know i've mentioned i have a we have a conference at ksc it's focused on the cubesats in october and i know where we sent 15 emulators to peru you know there are teams uh young people across the world especially in countries that maybe don't have really advanced space programs they're hungry for aerospace right they're just hungry for it the question is how do you equip them with the resources that they have to do some good um i just had an idea uh that i'll talk to you about offline about a way to collaborate in a way that might be a win-win for uh, fet and another organization that i work with so well if teachers were interested who are listening who who might have heard of it but never have experienced it um you know would you like to share the website like where can people go do they just search up you know phet yeah um, I mean, honestly that's the easiest thing to do is just to to, to search up phet or um fet interactive simulations but yeah and for those who are curious the ph comes from physics it used to be physics education technology and we don't say it out loud anymore like that because we also do mathematics and we do you know a, a, chem a lot of chemistry physical science more than just physics so right? from a from a grade age kind of background is there something that would go as even early as say like primary or does it focus primarily mm -hmm. yeah. on learning? So it's um, a lot of our work has been like the priorities are based a little bit on grant funding. Um, uh, so we started out with actually a lot of quantum physics, you know, higher level kind of stuff that was more related to um, the, the the original, you know, the, the founders original work. Right. Um, now we have math that goes all the way down to early math. So we're talking kindergarten, you know, number sense, things like that. So a lot of our math is actually most appropriate for primary level and into middle school. Um, and then uh, for our science, physical science, I would say most of it is squarely centered at secondary level, but could be used in intro college and certainly could be used in like um, across primary with, you know, appropriate scaffolding. Right. I, I think between friction and forces and motion. Yeah, it's, it's all excellent, 
and and the chemistry for classrooms that may not have resources for a lot of uh, wet chemistry labs, I thought some of the solubility stuff excellent mm -hmm. as well. So yeah. I'm yeah, big fan on that. Yeah. I'm um, glad to hear it. Yeah, let's talk just for a moment about the NASA heliophysics. Is and yeah, that's sure. Uh, I, let's talk about the the heat. Yeah, ambassadors and the program that you lead there. Are you still the um, sort of the driving force of that? Or is that just one of your additional duties that you perform? Um, so, I, I mean, I like to think of everything as a team effort, but I do tend to do most of the coordination. So our, our official lead, you know, of the project is Ramon Lopez um, out at University of Texas Arlington, who has been, you know, a huge ally and collaborator with AAPT for a long, long time. So. Um, from the get-go, I, I did a lot of the just general management coordination. So that's why most people, I, I deal with a lot of communications, basically. Okay. Are you uh, anticipating, are you going to have a, a summer workshop for new class of ambassadors? Yes, we, we will. Um, we'll be actually heading uh, to Chicago. Um, I think uh, I don't um, I don't remember the dates off the top of my head. Um, I will, would like to share that we haven't released it public publicly yet because we're just wanting to make sure we can get the meeting space and all that. But it will be in Chicago. I believe it'll be in June, and mm -hmm. I can actually pull up the dates. But I'm, I don't know if you have a way to share this information out once I have it. Yeah, if you um, if you just send it to Kevin, um, I'm hoping if all goes well, we'll be able to drop this tomorrow. In which okay. case, if you send it as soon as we're done, I can put it in the bio, okay. so that, you know, in the in the show notes. Awesome, thank you. And I should also mention, so AAPT has a NASA heat page where we will be posting all of this stuff. If people just Google, it's a lot of letters, but AAPT and then NASA and then heat, H-E-A-T. And maybe I should mention why we call it heat, by the way, it's Heliophysics Education Activation Team. Very so. good. I'm yeah. thinking too, when you, um, if you want to, when you share the website or, or whenever you have your you know the mm -hmm. locations procured we can certainly share it on our website um, so yeah. you know, we have, you know right. we're happy to do that yes and uh, in fact i taught a nasa heat lesson uh last year at the state science fair yes. uh, conference for educators mm -hmm. and uh, i also took a lot of the resources that you gave us when i was at your workshop i put it in a google folder and shared it with the everybody that attended so oh, they could awesome. quickly you know download these tremendous resources I, I really enjoy that. The the kids enjoy uh, the beads, the colored beads I that represent yeah. uh, different wavelengths. That that was a really good lesson. So I'm 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 really glad that you you know uh, to to have met you, Rebecca. And then again, I really appreciate the solid work that you're doing in, in so many different ways to help elevate you know Americans, especially how we but understand the world around us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm I really am super grateful that you're sharing out all these resources too, because I mean. Um, you know, uh, we have to find networks of networks and, <laughs> and that's, that's clearly what you've done. So yeah, thanks for, thanks for doing that. And I think more importantly, just, you know, like also, you know, even beyond NASA, right? Like having an appreciation and understanding of the world around us is really critical, right? Understanding how the sun affects us, you know, the risks, also the benefits of living next to an active star, um, you know, that helps us appreciate life a little bit more. And that's really right. what this is all about. So. It, it's the only thing in the universe that gives us without taking anything from us. You know, that's a great way to put it. <laughs> yeah. I normally end with like, you know, so what advice do you do you have for anyone? It sounds like that was like a really great piece there to, to recognize. However, I will leave the last um, words to you there for anyone who might be listening. I'm thinking particularly maybe even teachers who are kind of on that cusp of taking something that they're interested in and, and really kind of going full gear or even students who might be thinking about physics, like, uh, I sit through this class, what does it have to do? Parting yeah. words, all yours. You know, I guess I would say in everything that I've done and even in my own teaching, right? When I do get interested in something, like don't just rely on yourself, find people who have that like, um, uh, what we call privileged knowledge, which shouldn't be a privilege, right? But there are people out there, right? Who specialize in these things. They've gone before us, they have gotten that specific track and education that they needed to get where they are finding mentors just in general in life is probably the best piece of advice that i would give so again be it you know wanting to bring research or a particular topic into the classroom that maybe you as a teacher don't know all that much about that should not be a limiter right um you know find people who are willing to give a little bit and um and just don't take on the whole burden yourself 
because we no nobody gets ahead in life on their own. I, I really don't don't believe so. Really good advice. Well, we really appreciate you spending this time with us today, and I know Kevin's going to want to talk to you offline about this. So thank you again for your time. Thank you. Thank you.